can I plug so, in so, one, uh, oh. can I plug in one more? Because you, you talked about RAS. Is there anything else we should test? Because I test for BRAS. Right. So and which, what do you do with that? What, what I was, was going to say. So, <laughs> okay. so, what, what I, so what I was going to say, actually, is the other group we're going to look at in our study is there are about 8% of patients who are rapid progressors. Yeah. The patients who did very poorly, who were off the, well off the norm for, for disease, very aggressive disease. And actually, that's the first group we're, we're targeting to analyze to see if there's a molecular feature that would have predicted that. Now, I don't know that, but obviously the, the, the suspect that we'd, we'd be calling in is BRAF. Right. So let's talk first about, just to reset everybody, what are these, who are these BRAF patients? What, what, can we, what do we know about them? Uh, well, not all BRAF patients are created equal, but in KRAS wild type patients, their BRAF is a downstream n node. If you look at the cartoon of, of, of RAS signaling, BRAF it happens down below in such a way that if KRAS is wild type, if BRAF is mutated, it may still it may prevent or inhibit the ability of that inhi inhibition of, of uh, EGFR. So BRAF makes patients, for a variety of reasons, not just simply EGFR uh, inactivity perhaps, may, the average patient with a BRAF mutation does much more poorly. At least some studies suggest that there may be a halving of the overall survival in patients who are BRAF mutant compared to BRAF wild type. Now, I, I think it's murky to know if that's exactly true, but there is a, a national study that SWOG is running that all of the cooperative groups are participating in that is looking to take patients with BRAF mutation a after, f after progression at first line and move them directly into a different strategy because these are not patients who do well with subsequent therapy. In, at least in our hands, we find that patients do about the same over the initial course of therapy but deteriorate rapidly upon progression. And so we, uh, we and other centers, including uh, Sarah Cannon, we've been doing uh, work with BRAF targeting uh, therapies, and uh, Scott Kopetz is leading a national study that will look at a, a strategy uh, to that end in second line. I think this is, we do have to do that, and that's part of the first, the initial analysis is KRAS wild type patients mm -hmm. should get BRAF analysis. But Alan, I think it's important to point out this is not melanoma where you find the mutation and stick people on vemurafenib as a single it, that's agent. That's correct. It, that's correct. In fact, Scott, d Scott and others have done a study. Scott gets the most play looking at BRAF inhibition as a monotherapy, which is pretty much doesn't do much for colorectal cancer. But what we did, uh, some of us, uh, as uh, and Ryan Corcoran presented this a year ago, we looked at, we piggybacked on top of the melanoma group and put a MEK inhibitor together with a, B, a RAF inhibitor and saw activity, not dramatic activity. And now, as you know, we've, and you can talk about your study since you presented it. Uh, so why don't you talk about your study? But, but in other words, looking at multiple factors that might inhibit, might work at RAF, on RAF mutant patients. Yeah, I mean, I think we're seeing a lot about BRAF. We're finding it's a different disease, whether it's melanoma versus colorectal cancer, and, and a very beautiful piece of work that was done with Ryan Corcoran's group and others who have looked at this have seen that EGFR might be an escape pathway that colon cancer cells use against BRAF inhibitors. And so we saw two studies that were presented, and the SWOG study has an anti-EGFR component in it as well. Um, where we combined anti-EGFR with BRAF um, inhibitors plus MEK inhibitors or EGFR inhibitors plus BRAF inhibitors plus PI3 kinase inhibitors or EGFR inhibitors plus um, BRAF inhibitors plus chemotherapy. And I think what the most hopeful piece of all of this is, is that at least in, in the triple studies, the chemotherapy study didn't have a lot yet um, of data to present, but in those studies, they're showing response rates in the 35 to 40 percent range for BRAF mutant colon cancer patients who typically don't have a good response to therapy. So this is also gives some fire to Al's argument of trying to test early because BRAF mutation analysis is part analysis is part of the KRAS or that RAS expansion uh, standard RAS analysis as well. So it's good to identify those patients early and get them to study. Yeah, I, yeah, I totally agree. For the practicing oncologists, and that's all all of us too. Uh, it, again, if you're talking about the continuum of care and planning, uh, not to be doom and gloom, but BRAF mutation status is not a good thing. And, 
And also to put in a plug for clinical research, we're, we're all very interested in this group of patients, and that may be a, uh, the best option for individuals. But if you know someone's going to progress rapidly, as you're thinking of your sequential plan and the continuum, you need to know that uh, so that you can more effectively plan and discuss with that individual patient, including the availability of clinical trials. And I think, and, and, uh, so to summarize, it's not just expanded RAS, it's expanded RAS and RAF testing, BRAF testing, and BRAF should actually be readily available because melanoma yeah. does it. It's the same mutation like in melanoma. And then we'll have a national trial available yeah, so it's not that we, what do we do with this BRAF data? Uh, there are actually already consequences because this tri trial should be avail available through the NCTN. Now, it's, it's only about, it's a 10% of 40%, of so it's not a big number, or maybe maybe 5% of patients have BRAF mutations, but yep. it's just imperative to find those patients. It's an unmet need. It's probably the most molecularly well-defined group of patients that has a poor prognostic Correct. implication. without a doubt. Because we still kind of struggle with our KRAS, really mutations have prognostic implication. Yeah. But we know, it, there's also a shortcoming of our bubble diagrams, you know. If you really think KRAS and BRAF, you know, are one step from each other, but they should have similar phenotypes, but they are dramatically different. Gene expression profile is very different. It's a unique group of patients we need. I'm very happy to see these trials move forward. Right, and we talk about subgroup analyses all the time. This is the subgroup we've already found right. um, and that we're able to do something it's for. Fruit. It's a low-hanging fruit. That's the yeah. best phrase and that's of all. Actually, that's actually the first fruit. analysis we're doing, by the way, is in KRAS patients, we're looking at BRAF status. We actually have a lot of that information already, but it, wasn't, we, we, it hasn't been collated because in the community, most KRAS uh, patients who had KRAS assessment in the community had BRAF, so we have the data available. The information's there, we just haven't put the data together. So now